Okay. All set? Mm -hmm. uh, today is Friday, February 27, 2009. Uh, my name is Julian Reitman, and it's my pleasure to interview today uh, Bob Robert Herzog at his home in Stanford. And this is part of the Oral History Archive of the Jewish Historical Society of Lower Fairfield County. And as you know, Bob, I've been looking forward to getting a chance to talk to you today. And with that, we will start off. Uh, the first question, first question that I thought I'd ask you, Bob, is when did you come to Stanford? Came to Stanford in April of 1940. 1940. And where did you come from? I had lived in New York for a few years, and I was born and raised, grew up and went through college in Washington, Washington, D.C. Grade school, high school, and George Washington University. And I came up after I graduated from George Washington to New York worked in New York all my working life except for World War II. And uh, that moment we were married and on December 31st, 1939, we decided we wanted to live out of the city. Oh, in 39. And uh, started looking at houses and found a satisfactory one in Sanford for, for which we could pay rental. We rented a house for a year and then bought a house and lived in that house for probably 39 years. Where was the house? That was on Briar Bray Road. Oh. And then we uh, decided we could use a smaller house, so we went uh, hunting. That was 39 years later. We went hunting and found a house on Woodchuck Road where we lived 25 years until we moved in, into this retirement facility, an assisted living facility that for right. all. So how did you find the transition from New York to Stanford? You were commuting, right? I was a commuter. I worked in New York all my working life, as I said, except for World War II. And uh, I had no trouble with the commuting. During the time I was living in New York, I uh, spent some holiday time and some summertime with a cousin who had a home in Westport. Got sort of acclimated to the idea that you'd have to get up early and come home late. Didn't mind the commuting at all, made friends that way. I, so I really have no experience working here and being part of the daily business life of, of Stanford. And what happened in 40, when did you start working in Connecticut? I, ne I never worked in Connecticut. After I retired, I Consulting, but essentially, I never had a business career or life in Stanford or Connecticut, except in, in World War II. After enlisting in the CBs, uh, it was an announcement that, uh, well, first Yale and town and, uh, were looking for people who could do something besides run a riveting machine. And uh, I was interviewed there, and they recommended that I go up to Chance Fort Aircraft, which became Fort Sikorsky in Stratford. And I, I worked there with reasonable promotions and then uh, for wartime. And then uh, when they moved to Texas, their operation in Texas, I was lured to go back to work for the same firm I'd worked for before. 
I say, Lord, it was the only practical thing to do. I didn't want to live in Texas. So what sort of work were you doing in New York? I, I by accident, I joined a firm by accident and influence. I joined a firm that did hotel planning, hotel design. And uh, for some reason or other, without any design skills that I have recognized, I, I stayed with them and made a pretty good living and ended my career with that firm being a principal stockholder and uh, the firm joined a merger and in the terms of the merger I agreed to stay two years and, and I said I've been here long enough. So then I came back in retirement to Stanford. A few clients contacted me from time to time for short interviews but once, once you're out of the field you're out of it. That's really what you want. Now I know you've been interested in historical subjects all along. Uh, when did you sort of get interested in Stanford history? Well, it, I was interested in Stanford right from, right from the beginning. After all, it was my home. And uh, a man, well, early, early on, when Tressa Boulevard and all of that was going to be built and the throughway was going to come through, the turnpike was going to come through. An organization was formed called the Stanford Good Government Association. And maybe, a, maybe a good name, maybe a bad one, but the objective was to protect the homeowners and, and the population in general and try to make sure that what was going to happen would, uh, would be good for Stanford instead of bad for it. A man who you may have known or, uh, by the name of Joseph Chanko, who was with Condé Nast, uh, put this organization together. And somehow or other I met him. He became, obviously he formed it so he became president of it. And then we, when he was weary with it, uh, I became president and uh, other people you knew followed me in, in, into the organization and, and we, we think we did a good job for the community. And I got particularly involved in uh, uh, what was going to happen to zoning at Stanford was merged, you know, city and town government were merged. Probably, I think the merger finally went through in 1949, and the, we had very, very bad zoning and planning regulations in the first government. There was no protection for the individual property owner, and we managed to get the, in those days, to get your charter or your your body of local law changed out of the state legislature. There was no local authority at all. So we went to the local the legislature and had the zoning laws for Stanford changed. And the leaders in that were a local attorney by the name of Gordon Patterson. And uh, Irving Rosenblum was the attorney for our group. And did a, really a lot of the work. And part of my job was to get the community to support us and get our legislators to support us. That was my first taste of local politics. I found out that uh, anything you wanted done in Stanford, you, 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 didn't, you didn't do by having meetings. You had to stop for coffee at the right restaurant and see the right people. And I don't mean that it was undue influence, but you had to present your cause to the right people. We, had, we were very fortunate in the legislature at that time. And uh, 
and that Stanford zoning laws. Okay, it's the only city in Stanford, the only town in Stanford that has a zoning law that provides a right of appeal to the local legislative body. That you can go from the zoning board and the planning board to the board of representatives with the right of appeal here. It's, uh, it's probably more cumbersome than we'd like it to be, but it, it gives, gives the public a crack at it. Anyway, that's, that's ancient history now. It's just an accepted part of the local scene. So you go on from there. Uh, in terms of the people you were dealing with, were you aware that uh, any were particularly of Jews that, that you were dealing with, or it was just the broad uh, nature of the community? The, well, the Jewish community was much smaller, and uh, unfortunately they were, it was broken in, in, into two different segments. The old Jewish community, which grew from the uh, local merchant and professional community, uh, seemed to be perfectly happy with what was going on. And then there was, uh, there were quite a few Jews who moved to Stanford uh, right, right after World War II. And, uh, I, I suppose that they'd come out of New York or other places looking for uh, suburban living. Some of them had lived in Long Island and moved up here because the close-in communities of Long Island were getting crowded. And, and uh, we, a very large Jewish community developed here. Uh, a, 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 almost a second community. I've always regretted the fact that it, that it was a second community and didn't become uh, all one community, but there were, there were differences in, in attitude. The older community had been established. They had their friendships and their, their living style and all. And as far as religious aspect of it is concerned, uh, I suppose there was a larger Orthodox Jewish community or conservative Jewish community. And uh, the community that moved in here, well, I suppose, were a largely reform group, reform community. And, uh, I don't think they, I said it was a wonderful community. Uh, I think that that difference has completely disappeared. I'm very glad that that has happened, although I'm, I didn't remain a part of either community. I'm very glad that that has disappeared, but it certainly hasn't, uh, hasn't disappeared completely because I'm, I think the reverse has happened. I think since that time of very orthodox, including a Hasidic community has moved in, which has changed, changed that all over again. I don't know how much, uh, I hate like the Dickens to use the word, intermingling has occurred, but I, I'm sure it's still a uh, pretty, pretty separate community one from the other. I was uh, an early joiner probably in, 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 the, in its creation of Temple Sinai, but neither my wife nor I had ever been participants in any, uh, any Jewish organization, except, uh, I, I don't mean uh, Jewish organization, but religious community or, or the synagogue or temple or community, so we didn't stay in very long. Uh, all three of our children we want to go to Temple Sinai Sunday School when it was a very short duration. None of them were, neither of our boys was bar mitzvah or confirmed. Our older son was going to go through confirmation 
but the classes they held would, uh, if he stayed with it for a year or so, but the classes are, that were held were in conflict with public school schedules and that fell apart. So that, that was our total affiliation. My, my, our, among our closest friends were the first presidents and, and uh, fundraisers and everything else for Temple Sinai. So we joined for a few years, but we left it early on. It changed and we changed. And uh, from the point of view of well, you mentioned your children uh, and, and their religious uh, education. Uh, have they uh, identified with the Jewish community or not really? Not at all. Uh, well, uh, we, we lost a son at age, his age 39, and he had not, and uh, uh, all three of our children married to use of worn-out expression, married out of the faith. In fact, when our younger son was asked by the minister if, he, if his parents would mind if he uh, was married in the Protestant church by a Presbyterian minister, and he said he didn't think so because and then he said, maybe on second thought they would, because my brother and sister were both married in Catholic churches. So, so they were married out of the faith and have lived out of the faith, outside of the Jewish faith. Their children are not raised in the Jewish faith. So that, uh, that answers directly your question. And in your uh, growing up in Washington, uh, what was the Jew the Jewish feeling growing up in Washington in, in those years? Put that question again. When you were when you were you know a youngster, were you involved at all in, in any Jewish community in Washington? Uh, well, I was very definitely part of it, and uh, my, my mother was a member of the temples. Sisterhood. My father was wheeling the night breath and all that sort of thing, and I was confirmed in a Reformed congregation. I even have a little piece of paper that says so. Uh, but it was very Reformed, and unfortunately, it was the activities were uh, of that kind of a group was. Unfortunately, it was like many Reformed congregations. Uh, they worshipped they worship every Yom Kippur and every New Year was part of their ritual. And I think, uh, I, think I, I got a costume to wear Purim. And, but there was, in truth, there would be no religious observance. And with any depth at all. We well, were always part of the Jewish community. There wasn't any question that we were otherwise. I joined a, a fraternal organization that was, uh, they died during World War II, but it was a uh, Jewish fraternal organization that was nationally recognized with Greek letters. But, uh, so there, there wasn't any, any question of being other than the Jewish community. The, uh, going back to the 30s, you know, you graduated in the early 30s. Uh, did you have any sense of Zionism when you were in college? specific questions in that, but no, not really. Okay, now, uh, do you have any particular comments that you would like to 
record, you know, just to sort of, you know, uh, and looking back over your experiences that uh, you get a chance to put on the uh, recording. I'm just generalized. Obviously, you're asking questions about my affiliation with the Jewish organizations. I have, I have nothing specific. I, I'm living in a building quite by accident that's probably 75% Jewish in residency. I'm certainly perfectly comfortable here. Uh, I'm going to go on with this interview and stretch that a little bit. I hear Yiddish spoken that I never knew still existed in this world. I picked up, uh, I guess all my life I'd known a few expressions. I don't know where I got them. I tell the people here and they don't believe me that when I worked in New York I heard more Yiddish spoken by the black elevator operators in the garment district than I'd ever heard before in my life. And every once in a while I dig some expression out that I must have heard when I was 13 years old that happened to fit an occasion. And then, you know, then somebody whispers something here, that's not the right word. But, uh, so I, I never had that exposure. Uh, my parents were both, both born in this country. Well, at least three of my, I'm not sure of the fourth, but at least three of my four grandparents arrived here early in their life and, and had no, uh, had not carried with them any particular knowledge of, of their European ancestry. They knew they knew it was there. And I, I n never, not only in one case do I remember seeing any correspondence from the place of their, of their birth. Uh, obviously during the, the terrible periods before World War II and the Holocaust periods, we were, you know, we wife and I and, and my parents were both long gone, but uh, we certainly were aware of our Jewish heritage and the need for pitching in and doing something about it. I don't think that's what you're after. Well, one of the things is that this is not an organized interview. We're just wandering around. Uh, things that uh, bring back memories of your, you know, of your experience. And it's interesting that you point out that uh, three quarters of the people who are living here are Jewish and you are hearing Yiddish, which, uh, you know, is not something that you, you would automatically think would happen. Uh, no, because I, I don't really know where, you know, I can't give you any numbers of uh, how many of uh, the people living here were uh, formerly Stanford residents, but they, they've come from all over because uh, I, it's unfortunate is, is the case. Their children have put them here because uh, they lived in Florida or Arizona or somewhere else and their, their daughter or their son or their in-laws uh, went to work in Stanford or even in New York possibly and they couldn't commute back and forth to some some place where their parents had retired to be uh, loyal children or responsible children so they literally moved them to here is really, and this was one of the few buildings that was available close by. Uh, I don't think there's any uh, deep explanation. 
there were all their goodly number of, of uh, Stanford or resident, you know, people who've lived in Stanford for some years here, but uh, I sat down in the lounge the other night and had a conversation with the little lady and I thought she was going to tell me she, she had just come in and, and her son was here and that was how she had turned out. She lived in Stanford all her life. This, this small community that, as, as, as I told you, and I, I always thought it was an unfortunate situation. Many of us did. It was sort of remained segregated by congregation and background and all. But uh, I think we've labored that subject already. And I don't know if your question was you, to me was, was I involved in any Zionism or a Zionist move? And the answer is distinctly no, but they know my address when they're looking for contributions. <laughs> that they find. There's no question about that. Uh, how are you, do you want to keep going or are you ready to quit? I've talked myself to death, but you, you, uh, you're probably tired of hearing my voice already, but if, if you're working at this interview and you have specific things on your list that I should try to answer, I'll, I will do it. I mean, I'd like to cooperate if, if you have direct things, but generalities, what can I offer you? I guess the one question that I haven't asked is, have you witnessed any specific anti-Semitic Aspects, uh, either as a child or you know, in, 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 that you would want to bring up. I, I haven't asked that question. I've only had one very, very specific thing, and it wasn't in, directly in Stanford when we were looking for a house and trying to. All those years ago, in 1940, we uh, we had some friends who lived. Up Across the line up in Westchester County, and uh, we found a house we could afford. This was a rental, and we were very happy with it. It was a beautiful house, and we said we'd think it over. And when I called back to tell the agent the next morning, this was in Pound Ridge, told her the next morning that yes, we were interested, and I would send her a deposit check. She said. We've thought about it. We don't think you would be happy here. So that was obviously anti-Semitism, and she would, she was doing it very nicely, handling it as best she could. Were you aware that, that Darian was so anti-Jewish at that time? Well, uh, I never was aware of it because in Stanford there was a, certainly a large Jewish community and they would be hard pressed to uh, make any, you know, raise, raise that issue. But I can see that some of the gated neighborhoods might have a feeling, but I never went into it. I never approached it, never became a problem. I visited with people who lived in them, but uh, I, I never was aware of a problem. Certainly there were Jewish people living in nearby Westchester County at that time, but uh, obviously they were making an effort to keep it barren if they could. Well, I don't like to end the interview on a negative thing, so let's think of something positive, Bob. Well, it's been a wonderful community in which to live. We love Stanford. I became part of the community. I I was a candidate for representative on the first board of representatives from the Northern District. That's a pretty good answer to some of your questions. I think we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, I, I think it's very nice of you to cooperate with us and make the effort. And. Uh, 
it is interesting to hear, you know, what it was like in Stanford, you know, back before the town and, and city merged and so forth, and to realize about the uh, pattern of the Jewish community when you moved here. So I think that is a contribution that we're very happy about. Well, it, it certain, the community certainly has changed. We loved Stanford. Both of us were active. My, my wife was a volunteer at Stanford Hospital for 59 years. And uh, I don't think anybody asked her where she went to church on Sunday. There were certainly lots of Jewish ladies volunteering there over the years, and the heads of the hospital or wards had all sorts of feelings. Only a few Jewish people have stayed with the board of Stanford Hospital long periods of time. Many contributed money, but. I don't know that they took an active role in, in the hospital, but uh, that was her, her uh, long-term activity. And she was there several times a week for 59 years. And I participated, as I said to you, uh, in a very modest way, of the political you know, neighborhood political things. So it didn't seem to make any difference to anybody where I went to Sunday school. Yeah. Well, great. Thanks a lot, Bob. Thank you for your patience and hearing me jabber. On the contrary, <laughs> that's the whole point. Well, you listened, you were very polite, and you focused. <laughs> I think. <laughs>